All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 2020 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Matt Cabrera. I'm a second year student at MIT Sloan. I'm very happy today to pre uh, present today's panel of Finding the Favorite, Engaging Fans and Betters. This is also part of the business track presented by Ticketmaster. Today's panelists will be Zach Leonsis, SVP of Strategic Initiatives with Monumental Sports, Brian Joseph, VP of Digital with Sport Radar, Scott Kaufman Ross, Head of Fantasy and Gaming with the NBA, Doug Kazarian, the host of the Daily Wager with ESPN, and today's panel will be moderated by Chad Millman, the Chief Content Officer with Action Network. Today's panel will be about 45 minutes with a 10 minute question and answer uh, session at the end. If you would like to submit questions, we will be monitoring through Twitter the hashtag finding the favorite as you can see on the screen in front of you. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Chad. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for coming. This is a big deal because uh, in all the years that this conference has been happening, we've had one gambling panel. This year we have two gambling panels, and I think it's reflective of how big the opportunity is, how much people are talking about it, how much more legalization is happening, how much everybody wants to figure out how to get into this space. Um, this panel is about how to execute content, how to use content to engage fans, how to grow your audience. Uh, everyone in this panel can speak to it from a very unique point of view. In the past year, every major player every, in the media space, every team, operators, they're all trying to figure out, what do we do? So the first question, I know each one of these guys works in an office where they have a whiteboard and a bunch of people sitting around <clears throat> trying to figure out how big is the market. So from a team perspective, from a, deal, from a data and operator perspective, from a lead perspective, from a sitting behind a desk looking pretty perspective, <laughs> Zach, you start. Tell me what you think the market is. Good question. I think we're still all trying to figure that out, and we're impressed by the handle numbers that are reported out of states like New Jersey, particularly as they pass capitals like Las Vegas, too. Um, I think that the, you know, the metric that we were really trying to figure out was obviously what is the size of the black market, and that number ranges from a variety of experts from $100 billion to $500 billion in handle. I mean, it's just unclear what this market looks like, but what, what is clear is that it's happening. And so if the goal of keeping sports betting illegal was to prevent it from happening, that wasn't working, obviously. Um, it certainly led us to be an advocate for the legalization and regulation of sports betting. It's why we, um, through revolution growth, made investments in companies like Sport Radar and DraftKings. Um, we're investors in a real-time gaming platform called WinView as well, so we have exposure to a lot of different categories. Um, we worked with Scott and his off, uh, office very often in terms of uh, what the league rules and regulations might look like. And we're really excited to hopefully in 2020 unveil a brand new sports book operated and owned by William Hill in Capital One Arena um, later this year, which I think will be first of its kind. Um, and that is certainly a big business opportunity for our team as it is for the leagues as well. Brian. Yeah, so I won't comment on the, the dollars because that is just a shot in the dark. It is. But, well, let's uh, forget about the dollars for a second. Tell me what you think the audience is. Like, what is the addressable market here? Yeah, yeah. So there's been a lot of research that's been done around it, and it pegs it from, you know, anywhere from 100 million to several hundred million. But I think uh, the AGA uh, put out some research last year that had the number of 158 million. If you look at sports fans uh, on down through, uh, call it heavy or very frequent betters. So if we look at that number, you know, that's certainly a, a heck of a pie to go after. And uh, only a very small percentage of it are very frequent bettors. So there's a, a big part of that pie that creates a wonderful opportunity uh, for both media companies and betting operators to engage that fan and move them down that, uh, down that circle and get them more involved in, in betting. Scott? Yeah, I mean, we start with the size of the NBA fan base. You know, we had a over 150 million people watched some part of an NBA game last year. And so, 
you certainly start with the NBA fans and how many of them are interested in betting on sports or daily fantasy or traditional fantasy, which are you know, different ways to use predictive gaming to interact with our sport. And then the question becomes, does betting become a tool that engages people that maybe weren't watching basketball? So perhaps they're NFL fans and they bet on the NFL, and now they see an opportunity to start watching NBA games through a betting lens that maybe they did not. So, you know, the, the market size in terms of number of fans, you know, we think it, it, it's at minimum the size of our total fan base and then could certainly grow from there. At minimum the size of your total fan base. Absolutely. That is massive and ambitious. That is actually, I would say that is so much bigger than how people would normally think about, and Doug, I'll get to you in a second, but like the way people are normally thinking about how they want to approach the fan base and putting gambling in front of the fan base. Yeah, look, I think the way we think about it is we know that a lot of our fans are going to choose sports betting as a way to engage with the NBA. Now, many of them will not, so you know, there's certainly going to be people that they're more traditional, that's not the way that they want to experience the NBA. There's going to be people who are underage, there's going to be people who at least for the next three to five years reside in states where betting is not legal and regulated. But in terms of the opportunity, you know, there's a big difference between, between somebody who bets on $100 on the spread or the over-under or is betting heavily versus somebody who'll put $5 on a March Madness bracket. But really, all those people are doing the same thing in terms of using predictive gaming to engage. And so I'm sure we'll talk a lot about the opportunity with the casual fan where maybe it's not they're a heavy better and it's the primary way that they're engaging, but having a small bet on a, on a particular outcome or a particular thing that happens in the game enhances their experience of watching games and maybe gets them to watch games they otherwise no, would not have watched. Doug, what's your take here? Uh, I'm not privy to the numbers because I'm just behind a desk, but um, I, think, I think it's sort of like two groups, right? It's one that is gambling specific content like Daily Wager or ESPN's sports betting page Chalk versus all the other content that has now sort of added sports betting elements in it. And it's about determining the appetite of the consumer for both uh, avenues. And I think it's also important to remember that two years ago the Supreme Court did not invent sports betting. It already existed. It's just now it's sort of been greenlit, and so media companies are moving alongside the leagues. Everybody's sort of figuring it out together, determining and assessing the appetite of the fan. And you, like you talked about, the, you're looking it through the lens. So in non-gambling specific content, like the XFL has sort of putting up in-game spreads or things that will, I think, eventually other leagues will do on broadcast down the road. It's just how much is there an appetite for it and how much of it is too much for the everyday consumer. And that everyday consumer's uh, you know, sort of knowledge of betting will grow in due time as well, so that will change. But it's all about engaging and bringing in new fans and also that could be better, so to speak. But also it's another metric to sort of present the game and it's just very interesting even if you're not a better. So I think those are the conversations that are happening that are more in depth in gambling specific content, but are still definitely like resonating and applicable in the non-traditional gambling content. So that's a great point. Zach and then Scott, two things that Doug mentioned that are worth unpacking here. One is about sort of the use of content to bring people in, which you alluded to as well, Scott, but also the education component, like who are you speaking to and why. Zach, you guys did a betcast like on your NBA games, working with NBC in Washington. Tell me how that experiment came about, because that was not like yesterday. That was about a year ago when we were in the very early stages of sort of unpacking what this was like. Talk about the decision-making process to do it and then what the reaction was. Yeah, you know, we did see the potential for uh, PASP to be repealed several years ago. We made our own bet on that and we did get lucky in that it was. Um, and so we were prepping for that on, on what a rollout could look like. How would we educate um, our casual fan base who hasn't been to a Las Vegas sports book, which when you go for the first time can be a semi-intimidating experience. Um, it was also an opportunity to expose an audience to multiple kinds of betting opportunities, not just futures or um, daily fantasy lineups where you set and then forget and then maybe pray. Um, this is an opportunity to introduce in-play, which is 
I would say the dominant uh, betting product in the European market, certainly it is in the UK. And so last year we rolled out against 12 uh, Washington Wizards games. We turned on our NBC Sports Washington Plus channel uh, for a free to play predict the game feed where you could visit a, an online URL and during television timeouts or during the end of quarters or at halftime, you could predict um, who, which team was going to have three, um, the most three point shooting attempts or which team would have the most steals in the third quarter. Kind of opportunities like that. And the broadcast was complemented with more advanced stats that you wouldn't typically see in a traditional broadcast. And eventually we graduated to having totally separate on-air talent for those opportunities too. It was a great thing for us to experiment with because otherwise the NBC Sports Washington Plus channel just remains dormant. And so I think the team there led by Damon Phillips really deserves a lot of credit. We've rolled that out across 20 Washington Wizards games this season. The cumulative rating points have been higher for those games, which is fabulous. Um, and we would love to roll something out in the not too distant future um, against NHL games as well. What's the feedback you get from fans? The feedback that we get from fans, um, I, I think, uh, reflects a couple of different customer segments. Um, um, I, I would probably classify myself in the segment of being a data junkie. I can't bet, um, and I'm not interested in betting. Um, but I do have interest in what the real-time data points are out there that exist that I don't think a lot of people know about. A perfect example of that is if you watch the Major League Baseball playoffs in the World Series after every home run, you saw the launch angle of the ball, you saw the exit velocity of the baseball off the bat, and companies like Sport Radar are measuring those data points all the time for nearly every single play. You may just not know it, um, but those data points are going to become more and more relevant to potential prop betting opportunities. Um, I think it, it, it's a 1.0 version of where this could go, though. It's probably not advanced enough for the hardcore sports better, the Sharps audience, if you will. Frankly, your audience at the Action Network is probably more elementary for them. But I think for the casual fan base who we're really trying to open this up with, who's used to daily fantasy primarily, 70% roughly, Scott, you probably have better numbers than, than me, 70% of that audience, um, indicates that they would be interested in making a legal sports bet. Um, that's the audience we're trying to appeal to and also onboard and, 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 and educate. If you could, why wouldn't you want to bet? What's not interesting about it to you? <laughs> no, well, I'm not allowed to, Jack. I know that. For obvious reasons. <laughs> I said if you could. If I could, well, maybe I would if I could. I, I've, I've enjoyed uh, daily fantasy for the NFL. Um, I, I'm, I'm in a fantasy football league like many people in here. Uh, it's a great communal um, you know, sort of factor for us. We've got a nice long text message thread. We get together every year for the draft. So I probably would if I could, but I, I can't, unfortunately. But you make a great point. Like, there is something communal about it, right? And so when you think about, Scott, like the total addressable market for the NBA, it's part of that. And the NBA is as good as sort of creating a community as any league there is because of how active on social all the fans are. Do you think about betting as being the next iteration of the opportunity to create that community? Yeah, it's interesting. Again, we see betting as part of the fan experience. And so the way that our approach to content has been developed kind of starts with how do we solve for making sure our fans who are choosing to use, again, this lens by which to engage with the NBA, how do we make sure they're having the best possible experience? So that sort of has informed, you know, and I'll get to the content point in a sec, but it informed our strategy to partnerships. So we've opted to do non-exclusive partnerships with all of the major operators, where we license our real-time stats feed so they can so that can uh, fuel in-play betting and they can have a rich content experience. We license our marks and logos so that it creates a much more authentic looking platform and so we no longer have to say pro basketball championship and you know BOS versus UTA. It looks like an authentic product that an NBA fan would want to engage with. And you know we partnered with everyone from MGM and FanDuel and Foxbet and William Hill, more recently with some of the up and coming books like points bet and the score because we want everybody to be able to offer that experience to our fans. Everyone at least that's legal and regulated of course. And, and we kind of see content in the same way is we have many content partners from the ESPNs and TNTs of the world that broadcast our games to the regional sports networks like NBC Sports that broadcast locally and then we have the digital properties as well, you know, Bleacher Report and Yahoo Sports that are delivering content to fans as well. 
And that creates a lot of opportunity to experiment. And we thought it was really interesting what Zach and the folks at NBC did because it gave us an opportunity to experiment with this idea of an alternate telecast. And the reality is when you think about sports betting content and how big it can be and what it should look like, what's the voice, the reality is we have no clue. And the, answer, and the reason for that is there really isn't a lot of precedent for this. You know, internationally, sports betting content is not really a thing that is offered in you know, the UK and Australia. It's, it's naturally woven into the way that people consume sport. It's not this other thing that came in afterwards. And so we really have to be experimenting to find out what is the right balance, right? What is the right balance of betting integration versus traditional integration? That's why something like an alternate telecast is great because you're not necessarily, you know, changing the way your primary telecast works and a more traditional fan can still watch that, but you give them an option to do something else. And through shows like The Daily Wager and through alternate broadcast, you can start to figure out what is the right voice? What is the right level of integration? Are you speaking to fans too in the weeds with numbers and analytics or is it too elementary? And we like that we have a variety of content partners that we can experiment with NBA content with through them and it doesn't necessarily all have to be on NBA TV or NBA.com. So Brian, Scott mentioned international. Sport Raider is an international company. Yep. Explain what translates from overseas to here and what is never going to translate from overseas to here. <laughs> Well, I'm never going to say never, but uh, what I think is really interesting about the U.S. market is just the sports that are most popular here are fundamentally different than, than soccer, which drives uh, the bulk of the interest outside the U.S. And the presence of fantasy for you know 20 plus or much longer than that, probably even years, has wired the U.S. sports fan to follow individual players and individual player performance much more closely. So uh, whereas a player prop uh, outside the U.S. might be viewed as more of a marketing tool, here in the U.S. Uh, there are some of the belief that those could become very real, very popular markets, not just as a top of funnel user acquisition uh, opportunity for uh, operators to offer, but uh, more legitimate markets as, they, as the U.S. market, excuse me, continues to grow and mature and uh, the operators start to better understand uh, the consumer here in the U.S. and what they really are most interested in engaging with. All right, Doug, so you've been doing Daily Wager for a year. Mm -hmm. And in that time, how has the show evolved and how has it evolved because of what you're seeing consumers are reacting to positively or negatively? It's every day it's fluid and we're trying to find that sweet spot. I think integration is the right word. I mean, I kind of, the parallel is, you know, fantasy, right? And X amount of years ago, PPR was not a household term and now it is. So certain things in the gambling space will continue to become part of the vernacular of sports fans. And it's just sort of, I think the launch angle, and that was a great example because in due time, where we have kind of win probability we've used on sports center and things like that, we'll have money lines as sort of gauging how big of a comeback is. And it's just gonna be a part, another metric, not the only metric, but another metric to be used. In terms of our show that is gambling specific, we've tried to understand that it's also a TV show. And I think something that everyone up here understands and most of people out there is that it's entertainment as much as it is maybe a fiscal opportunity. And so when you're doing a TV show, it should also be entertaining. And, but it's just like kind of the sports center meetings I used to be in when you have, let's just say it's not Super Bowl weekend, it's just a, a day in November. And you got hockey on, you got NBA, you got some NFL look ahead to the weekend, let's say it's a Wednesday. And usually if somebody goes for like 50 points or four goals, that might be in the top of the show. But if you have sort of tough calls to make, you have to make decisions that are based on an entire country that has different appetites for each sport and different sort of percentages in each demo of the, of the country. So we do that in our show as well. Yeah, the, like, like tonight, Lakers Bucks is probably going to lead every show and it would lead the gambling show. But sometimes it's not that easy. And then you just kind of go off that. You look ahead to the weekend and you can use the numbers from the sports books to figure out which has the biggest handle. That probably has the biggest interest for ratings. So we're doing a TV show based on entertainment and what is the most value to the, throw the widest net out there. But how hard it is, and this Which is, is something I'm sure you do too. Sure, every day, but this is content isn't about me. Okay. <laughs> uh, Always about you. Everyone who wants to check out the Action Network is welcome to go check out Action Network. There we go. But this is a good question for everybody to sort of think about, which is how far is too deep in the weeds? And like the stuff that might appeal to you 
as a veteran gambler and someone who's been in the industry for a long time, might not be the best way to pull someone in who is novice and is just understanding and is hearing about gambling for the first time because it just they live in New Jersey and it just became legal or they right. live in Indiana, et cetera. That is the question we kind of debate a lot and discuss a lot in our show meetings because the, the room is made up of people from different um, sort of competency levels. And you just kind of have to kind of get a feel and make judgment decisions like you do on content all the time. But we, we try to kind of figure things out as we go along and ESPN's done okay creating content for the sports consumer. But every day, we're, you know, all of us are trying to get a pulse of what that, that sweet spot is. And it's just, you kind of go with your gut instinct to someone, you know, as on the fly on air, you just kind of got to trust your instincts. And when I first got to ESPN, it's, you know, where do you draw the line? If you say Bill Belichick or Tom Brady, most viewers should know who that is. But, you know, do we all know the manager of the, the Kansas City Royals? Like, so you just have to kind of think about that, like I said, sweet spot. And the same goes for any category, hockey fans and things like that. And you do it for the gambling terms as well. So Zach, what do you think sort of the role of educating the fan needs to be when you're thinking about onboarding them for gambling? Do you need to be thinking from a content perspective, nobody knows anything? Or when you're thinking about the betcast, like, do you want to cater to that hardcore fan? How are you trying to frame that? I think we need to find ways to uh, personalize and cater to both, frankly. Um, I think one of the primary responsibilities for us is to make sure there's a cohesive ecosystem between what you're seeing on the screen and also what your experience is on a mobile application or what your experience is in person. And I also think it's our responsibility to try to elevate the conversation too. There's the stereotype about what a sports better looks like and what a bookie could be. Um, but as you get to know a lot of these betting operations, um, you understand that they're buttoned up, suit and tie, fully regulated, bureaucratic sort of issued um, uh, businesses um, with people who have titles like chief trading officer. They're not head bookie or whatnot. And so we want to treat sports betting as an elevated conversation and treat it more like stock trading, frankly. We want to equip you with a lot of data and uh, you know we've been vocal about saying that our the book that William Hill will operate will feel less like a cocktail lounge, and we want to make it feel more like an Apple Genius Bar with people coming up and saying, "Hey, have you made a bet before? How familiar are you with this? Would you like me to explain anything to you?" We want to have a hands-on experience, and maybe even host training courses and classes hosted by William Hill that walk through different types of opportunities, so that the American consumer in our region is fully educated. Um, people need to be educated, knowing what they're getting into before they put real money down on the line. I think that's fascinating. It's something that we talk about all the time: is like, how do you? How do you get people who are just figuring out what betting is because they never wanted to bet illegally and it's now legal in New Jersey, Indiana, Pennsylvania? Scott, you, you look like you're shaking your head. Well, uh, you know, it's interesting. I think over time, right, right now, as we were saying before, there's kind of the traditional game is here, the traditional program is here, and then the sports betting programming is here, the sports betting broadcast is here. And that's great in terms of experimentation. But I think over time, they're going to become more intertwined, and we'll find what that balance is. Because if you think about it from a fan perspective, you know, take the Lakers-Bucks game, the question is, what are the storylines of that game? And what are fans thinking about? And do they have a prediction about what they think is going to happen in the game, and therefore, how do they act on that prediction? And right now, the content is more 1.0, where it's, here are the games, here's what the lines are, here's where we think you, you might want to put your money, versus, OK, the storyline is Giannis versus LeBron. And if you think Giannis is going to have a great game against LeBron, and you want to play that somehow, here's, LeBron, uh, here's Giannis is over. Or you know you think that there's going to they have a great defensive plan you know the, what the Rockets are doing now with their small ball lineup we think that's going to be a great defensive strategy and therefore we think there's going to be fewer points and so the way to play that is the under so it's not necessary I think we'll get to a point where it's not necessarily here's the way to think about the betting stuff that's going on but more here's what you might think about the game and if you're interested in betting here's how you can take that prediction about what might happen and take that to the next level yeah. I, I, yeah, well, Brian, then Zach. Well, yeah, yeah, I want to jump in there quickly because I think it's really important, and it, it, 
piggybacks on what you were saying a little bit earlier when you took us through your psyche a little bit, and you know, not a better, but I'm interested in some of the advanced stats. And what I think is starting to happen in the same way that RSNs you know, came out and started producing two different broadcasts for a particular game, they did that because the fans turning into that game had different interests. So if it's a Wizards versus a Bulls yeah. game, I'm a big Bulls fan for better or worse, I'm tuning into that game because I want content about my favorite team in the same way that a Wizards fan wants content about their favorite team. So that was one split that happened. And now what we're talking about about is the opportunities that can be created by new data and new metrics, whether it's betting, advanced stats, or you alluded to segments, those who have access to data about their fans and consumers will be able to start to figure out what those motivations are for why a consumer is tuning into the game and start to work towards that one-to-one -one personalization that Scott was talking about to where uh, I also firmly believe that it will fold back together to where if the five of us were to hop into an app to watch the stream of a game, we could have five different contextual experiences around that game based on what that platform knows about us and their ability to deliver content to meet our needs. Zach, you I, to jump yeah, in. I was just going to say that um, two points. We will never force feed betting on someone. It's, a, it's an opt-in opportunity as opposed to an opt-out. That's why it's a NBC Sports Washington Plus and not NBC Sports Washington to watch the alternate feed. Um, that's why the book will be located in one part of the building and not throughout the building and for, for most cases at least. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that I would add is that, you know, we think that this is an enhancement to the fan experience. Um, we don't want to take away from the actual game product itself. One of the great things from a business perspective is that we think this will increase ratings, increase pe people doing research on teams and on players, making them bigger fans. It's good for the teams. It's good for the leagues. We can't be serving people prop questions during the actual broadcast so they're not watching the actual game. So I think what Scott is saying is in saying that we're, we're focusing on the storylines, we're transitioning to the storylines, I think that's exactly right. We still have to focus on the game itself and betting is a complementary feature to what already exists, which is a great product. I mean, that's what it is now, but I wouldn't say that can't happen as we go along. I mean, right now, in states that are legal, you have fans in those seats watching the game and during you know, timeouts or whatever, betting, making bets. So I guess the question is, right now it's separate, and this will all happen organically, and one, you know, one league will be ahead of the other. You know, eventually it will all kind of overlap, but in due time it may be synchronized. Like the XFL has started with the team listed, you know, NY for New York with the minus five in parentheses, like you typically only see in other parts, but if it's going to be integrated, completely overlapped, I would say we could be headed down that path eventually in all sports, in all broadcasts. It's just part of it, much like we see certain stats pop up on the screen and they don't always get read by every consumer. Some do, but some are just enjoying other aspects of the broadcast, but I think it could be completely synchronized in due time. How soon do you think that could happen, Scott? I think it's gonna take some time, mm -hmm. especially because of the way that the states are rolling out sports betting, right? Sure. I mean, there, there's a lot of exuberance right now about sports betting, but if you think about true mobile sports betting, when I say true mobile, I mean, I'm in my house, I can download an app, I can put in my credit or debit card, make a deposit, and then start betting, and I don't have to physically go into the casino or be on the property. There's only six states right now in the country, roughly 11% of the country, where you can do that. So we're still very much early days. And so when we talk to the consumer about you're at home and you're watching the game or you're on your mobile phone, you place a bet, very few people can actually do that in a legal and regulated way. So it's going to take some time. You know, we're roughly you know, five states a year or so are turning on. So you're going to have a three to five year time horizon where this does sort of still have to be kind of over here. Uh, because it's, it's, a, it's an opt-in experience. We have to figure out what the right tone is, and we don't know who, who's going to be able to bet in any given year because of the state-by-state rollout. But, and I think the reason that there's not a lot of precedent in UK and Australia is because for, for gambling content, it's been legal there for so long. They have figured out how to make it an or, organic part of their content without having to have these separate shows. So I think it necessarily does need to kind of be a separate opt-in standalone thing until we find out A, what the right voice is and how people want to see it, and B, there's a critical mass of states where it makes sense to be having a national broadcast where you're integrating these things because those fans can then go bet legally from their phone. How soon do you think before it's all integrated? 
We were talking about um, not having alternate feeds or anything like that in the UK market because it's always been that way. It's built into the lexicon. It's part of the vocabulary. Um, in the United States, there's still a significant portion of the audience that looks at sports betting as a sin. It's a boogeyman, and that's what we're trying to explain just isn't the case, and regulation here really is the answer. I think all of our, one of our big collective goals, whether it be from a, a legislator standpoint or an operator standpoint, um, is to capture as much of the black market as possible. We want as many dollars in the light as possible. Um, and so that's gonna be a little bit of an art, just as much as, as it is a science, listening to customer feedback. Um, and I tend to agree with Scott that I think it will take a little bit of time um, we may get there. I, I would expect that maybe some of the smaller secondary leagues uh, push the boundaries a little bit faster than the larger leagues, um, and that's not necessarily a, a knock against anyone. It's not necessarily a problem or an issue either. I would also just say I'm not sure it's an either or, right, because it certainly could be both. And I think sooner rather than later, you'll get to a point where most of the leagues and broadcasters feel comfortable mentioning the lines in the broadcast in the context of storytelling, like we were saying before, right? If you're coming down to the wire and it's a 10-point game and the spread is eight points, that's an interesting tidbit in the way that your fans are watching. But perhaps that truly integrated, stat-rich, odds, odds, you know, in a streaming way, uh, on a digital overlay, free-to-play game integration, that might still be a personalized experience. And, and at the NBA, we're doing a lot of testing, we call it our next-gen telecast, with very personalized streams, right? And it's different fans, you know, there's the, the hardcore fan, not necessarily the hardcore better, but that really wants the next level analysis about defensive strategies and what's happening in the game. And then there's, you know, the younger fans that maybe they want influencers who are, who are giving audio to the game rather than just, you know, the traditional broadcasters. And then maybe there's the gaming focused fan that wants all the stats, all the data, all the odds updating in real time as part of their experience. So I think there's, there's room for both, but we have to be experimenting in this time. And I think the stigma is a good point, like how the, 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 the I don't know, the, the visualization of it is so different here than it is in the U.S. And I know, and I think it's okay that things to happen organically, I think it's okay for leagues to kind of proceed cautiously because there was an unknown. I mean, I know there's people passionate about betting like myself and others who were just, why won't they mention the point spread? It's because they have a multi-billion dollar industry and the TV companies do as well and everyone's just kind of trying to figure it out gradually and there's always going to be sort of shocks to the system. I mean, even Tony Romo was a shock to the system, calling out the play in advance, right? No one really had done that before, and it just sort of took on a life of its own, and then in due time, it worked itself out and figured out what the right way to treat it was, and they're probably still doing it. But I think for us in the betting space, the digital content's much more, you can kind of tailor it to preferences and settings, but for the broadcast of games and other uh, universal shows, I think you're just kind of figuring it out, and I think it's okay because it's such a new frontier for us as opposed to the UK. So, did you want to weigh in? I, I don't know if I was cutting you off from anything. No, I was just, I, I think it's really interesting because we spent a lot of time talking about OTT and how that is just a wonderful, I guess, canvas or platform for experimentation right now. Uh, but what's also really unique is when you're talking about the different segments, you know, the, the sharp and the casual better, uh, what media companies have now are various different platforms that they can produce content for to reach different audience segments to where, you know, for the main broadcast, yes, it might take a little bit of time before that really converges, but OTT, podcast, editorial, subscription, there's a lot of different levers that media companies can pull to reach different segments of that potential betting audience to, uh, again, learn more about that consumer and tailor it moving forward. So that's what I think is really exciting as well uh, because, Again, in the past, if you just had a single linear broadcast, that's very difficult if you're going to look to shake it up at all. So now, a lot more tools, resource, plan, uh, excuse me, platforms uh, that media companies can experiment with. So Zach mentioned the black market and sort of that world where people might have been betting on the black market, they might not bet on regulated markets, and it sort of could be the people who are just new to the space that are figuring out, excuse me, like what they want to do in sort of a regulated capacity. How much can content be a Trojan horse, do you think, Zach, I'll start with you, to converting people who have been betting on the black market and get them into the regulated markets? 
Well, he's exactly right in saying that linear is disadvantaged because it has limited shelf space. OTT, you could spit out six different kinds of streams. Um, and within a direct-to-consumer offering, you could create different package types too. Um, I could certainly imagine a package type that's an alternate betting feed um, with a faster um, streaming speed um, that you pay for and potential free play tokens integrated into a package as well. You get five free dollars per month to, to bet with. That would certainly be an onboarding opportunity in the future. Um, but I think the, you know, sort of the, the bigger onboarding ac activity is really just letting people know that these opportunities exist because I still think for a, a significant majority of the country outside of daily fantasy, they don't have a lot of exposure. I know that your audience certainly does have exposure, but I think that, um, you know, for a lot of people, they, they, they've never been to a Las Vegas sports book. They just, they wouldn't know better. And the, the way we really get to capture most of the black market is by really open and accessible mobile rules. Um, competitive pricing across mul multiple platforms. I think that mobile uh, betting rules are paramount. Uh, we have some different rules in DC that we're dealing with. Um, we're happy that DC will be one of the first states to pass legislation, um, but we'd prefer better and more open uh, mobile betting rules, frankly. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a huge part of our strategy. And again, why we're doing everything non-exclusively is we want to play a major role in making it very clear to consumers who the legal licensed operators are and differentiate them from the offshore operators. There are still a lot of people in our country that saw, okay, sports betting is now legal and think they can now use my bookie and five dimes and these other sites because they saw sports betting was legal. And so we have to educate fans to let them know where the safe, legal, licensed places to bet are. And the best way we can do that is by making the experience of betting on a regulated platform better. We're only providing our real-time data feed to legal, regulated operators. We're only providing marks and logos to legal, regulated operators. We're only accepting advertising from legal, regulated operators. And we have to educate our media partners you know, certainly ESPN knows this at this point, but not to take advertising from those other companies. And you'd be surprised over the last two years how many major media companies still took money from the offshore market. And most of it is just lack of knowledge. They, they don't know one from the other. And so we all collectively here have to help play that role because the only way we're going to crowd out the offshore market is by making the product better and making sure you can market to the right consumer. And the other piece of it is there's an element here that we all need to be careful with not flooding the market with too much content, with too much advertising, because then you get into these overcorrections that we're seeing overseas. You're having a lot of markets where the sports betting advertising and content got out of control, and now there's just a blanket prohibition on that. And that's not a great scenario either, because then, again, you don't have the ability to drive people towards the regulated market. So we need to be playing that role as a as an industry and making sure we're doing it in a responsible way. So we have about uh, 18 minutes left. So if people have questions, start sending them in and I'll start looking at the iPad in a few minutes. Um, Scott, you mentioned before, you can bet on Giannis versus LeBron, you can bet on the Bucks versus the Lakers. The derivative market using player props, things like that, translate, transferring people from being fantasy fans to DFS fans to betters, moving them down that funnel. Doug, I'll start with you. How much activity, what kind of reaction are you seeing the player prop market and content around the player prop market? How many points will Giannis have tonight? More or less than 27 and a half. Does that bring new people in or is that just catering to the same audience? Well, I think the conversation about that is now different than it was five years ago, right? I think prop bets driven by the Super Bowl coverage are sort of familiar to the audience. The concept of heads versus tails, the simpler the prop. So when you have LeBron, I think earlier this season we did a segment that was used on the Sports Center and other platforms, yes or no on a triple double. Like that's pretty basic and it's LeBron, right? So when you have Giannis and LeBron, especially with the MVP conversation getting buzz, I think what we have found that some casino operators have figured out with us is just how much topical storylines will drive betting interest. Like the Houston Astros is a great example, right? So you have this investigation, and then William Hill, I think, was the first entity that put up a prop over under of how many players will get hit by a pitch during the regular season. 
And then another sports book tried to one-up them, so to speak, and said, here are the odds of eight guys. Who, what are the odds in the first, to get, the first Houston Astro to get hit by a pitch? Do you go with the leadoff hitter? Or do you maybe go with the fourth hitter in case one guy gets on, it's two outs, and it's safer for the outcome of the game? Right, so there's handicapping in that. And I just think the sports books are getting a lot smarter about generating handle, because that's what they want. And they also realize that the media is free advertising, right? So if they do cool, kind of like the minor leagues used to do with some of their ticket giveaways that were very topical, the sports books are doing that as well. And then prop bets are an obviously an easy way to sort of package it and present it. But I think that's the sort of, you use the phrase Trojan horse earlier. I mean, that's a way for them to get um, utilization with the sports betting kind of component and content. You're right, we are totally suckers. Like if somebody, <laughs> You know, that Houston Astros... Free food, and then... <laughs> exactly. That Houston Astros hit by pitch, who, like, the odds on will it be Bregman, will it be somebody right. else, like, the number of 83 and a half. But what I find is it's an incredibly stimulating conversation. And you don't have to be a gambler to appreciate it. You don't have to be a gambler to appreciate it, and everybody is angry about the Astros, right? And everybody is trying to figure out, and all of a sudden they're talking about how many times will we be hit by a pitch over the course of a year. We actually have people who are doing real analysis on it. That's where sort of it, it becomes, you know, the theater of the absurd because, you know, Doug, I know you and I will both like spend a lot of time analyzing whether or not the national anthem is going to go <laughs> over or under for the Super Bowl. And then we will go on 55 million radio shows before the Super Bowl and talk about it and like talk about the analysis. And as silly as it is, people get so excited about it. Like they get so jazzed talking about what some of these prop bets can do. But I think that speaks to the stigma sort of discussion. I think in just everyday non-traditional bettors, if you mention you bet on the national anthem at the Super Bowl, I think it's like accepted at Super Bowl parties because it's, it's been sort of welcomed with open arms subconsciously more than anything. But if you're like, yeah, I'm sweating out whether there's be a hit in the sixth inning of this Mariners A's game in middle of July, people are going to look at you funny. I just think it's all about like the conversation and the tone and how it's sort of become and the coverage of sport, Super Bowl props and how it's a big thing and it's just so, like squares or, mar or bracket pools are, are much more acceptable, but it's all the same concept. And I'll even go farther as like fantasy and all that, but that's a def conversation for a different day. But I, I just think it's all about sort of the presentation of it and then the, you know, sort of where we are moving the needle, so to speak. So Zach, you guys will have a book <clears throat> in the arena. Um, would it be tremendous for you if on a Tuesday night, you know, you've got an NBA game going on yep. and the book is packed and there is a massive conversation going on about Bradley Beal's, you know, total points scored that night. Do you feel like that's a victory? Do you feel like that's something that you worry about? Do you not care as long as it's engaging the broadest audience possible. I think as long as it's engaging the broadest audience possible and um, you know our players still feel safe and protected, which I'm sure the league will um, have a, uh, a heavy hand in and the NBA is really, and all leagues have really taken a very thoughtful approach as to what teams are allowed to do, how players can be involved and where you're not allowed to be involved. I think the thing that excites me more than that though is um, as a company that owns our 20,000 person arena, um, we look at our arena as one of the busiest in the country. That's great. It's booked over 225 nights a year. Um, but still, the, the, the arena is only full from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. And during the rest of the day, it's mostly empty. I think the thing that really excites us is opening up the book for an NFL Sunday, a Saturday morning EPL match, a uh, UFC or boxing pay-per-view opportunity when we think we could get a couple thousand people to actually come and watch together. March Madness would be a great opportunity. Everyone likes to go out to Vegas for the first weekend of March Madness because you like the communal atmosphere. You like the energy and the buzz in the book of you put $20 down on a game and everybody's in it together. Everybody wants to see if you hit the over or whatnot. Um, so the idea of potentially opening up the book into the lower level concourse, maybe to an end zone section or, or maybe bigger, um, I think is a lot of fun. Certainly a great way to drive F&B and, and, and a lot of merchandise too. Um, we saw a lot of success with that when the Capitals went to the Stanley Cup Finals. We hosted away viewing parties. We said, come on in for free and just buy your F&B here. Um, and it was packed. People couldn't wait to come in and enjoy a really interesting and fun and exciting moment together in person. I think we'll, we'll try to experiment with that. By the way, you just said F&B, and I swear to God, I thought you were going to be like, 
F and beer, and I thought you were swearing on the panel. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we got a lot of questions. I didn't realize we had so many questions. I apologize. Um, Brian, I'll start with you. Uh, how will the integration of 5G impact the personalized gaming experiences? Ooh, the data is going to move faster, the streams are going to move faster, everything's going to move faster. So that means uh, more markets can be offered, traded on, and it just becomes a much, much more seamless experience. Uh, we as consumers, especially as it relates to our phone, do not like to wait. Uh, think about when you click into an app, if it takes <laughs> more than a second, we start losing our patience. So uh, I, I think that 5G, as, as that starts to roll out and really become uh, universal across the market, Faster data, faster streams, more markets, because the operators can move faster. So uh, that's a good thing for all involved. All right, Scott. I promised Scott that I would not ask an integrity fee question. <laughs> but this is not me asking. This is someone in the audience asking. Of course, yeah. Um, but it actually is an, an interesting question. Uh, not that the audience can't ask interesting questions. but. You know, Doug, we just talked about the Astros and the hit by pitch props, right? And all of a sudden, the integrity of the game is in question in a much different way because people are saying, should the Astros World Series title be taken away? In a world in which betting is becoming more and more legal and leagues are taking on more of the responsibility for integrity by making deals with operators and charging for data, are leagues now more responsible for the community of betters and money won or lost if there is some kind of sort of nefarious play in the sport that causes some kind of big win or loss to have to be overturned. You know, you could have just not read the question, Chad. <laughs> uh, no, well, this was a prompt. It was nice. Um, since day one, when, when our commissioner wrote that op-ed, integrity of the game was always at the forefront. And the reason that we opposed sports betting for so long is because we thought 25 years ago, 30 years ago, that the best way to protect the integrity of our games was to not have sports betting. But of course, we saw the development of the illegal market, and when smartphones came along and it became so easy to bet illegally, it became clear that we would be in a better position to protect the integrity of our games in a regulated market. It was happening anyway, and so with transparency, with you know, regulation, we would be in a better position to work together with the industry to, to, do, to protect our games. And one of the primary things we have in all these relationships with the operators is an integrity collaboration, a sharing of data so that we can help monitor suspicious betting patterns. We agree that there is going to be heightened focus on the integrity of our games when, with, with sports betting growing throughout the country. And so we are significantly increasing our efforts in this, in this endeavor. I mean, we're increasing our training and education of our players and our employees and coaches. We have enforcement capabilities that have been built up. We've hired several people and data analysts so that we can monitor what's happening in the betting patterns and identify anything that might be suspicious. So we take it very seriously and agree that there is going to be an expectation that in a world of legalized sports betting, the leagues are going to do more to protect the integrity of our games. And that's exactly what we're doing. And, and operators are on the same side as the leagues. They want fair play, right? That that's what they want. But I also think it goes back to the stock parallel is that there's a certain element of leap of faith that you are taking when you, with, I mean, there's insider trading going on at some companies. You just, you know, it doesn't mean you shut down Wall Street. And I'm sure there's some college kid who may or may not have shaved points at some point in the last 15 years that was not exposed. It just kind of happens, but you take a leap of faith. I mean, look at the last minute of every sports contest, whether it be football, the game's played differently with prevent defense, basketball, you got the chucking threes, fouls, goalies are pulled in hockey, baseball, the strategy's different with the bullpen. So already it's kind of unpredictable and erratic at the end of these games that affect the spread outcomes or even prop outcomes. So in general, there's just a leap of faith across the board it kind of just comes out in the wash, in my opinion. And, and I would just add that there, there's a misconception, you know, when the league came out and spoke about our role in protecting the integrity of our games, that that meant that we don't think the operator should be doing it or that the regulator should be doing it. The reality is everybody needs to be doing it because everyone has blind spots. The regulators only have purview into what's happening in their state. The operators only have purview into what's happening on their platforms. And so we all need to be doing everything that we can so that we're doing 
the maximum possible to protect these games because there is that expectation for the consumer. There is that leap of faith. So everybody needs to be all hands on deck to make sure that we're doing everything we can. All I know is if I bet on the Dodgers in the 2017 World Series, I want my money back. That's what I would say. Zach, uh, this is a good question too. Could betting as sort of a vertically integrated company, right? Could betting negatively impact the in-game experience? Or could it end up being where something like everyone wants to watch Red Zone because they want to watch every game and see, what, see the action and see how it's going for them with every single bet they have on a Sunday? Vertically integrated. Well, I want to make clear that we don't own equity in the book. We're not going to be operating the I meant building and team. Building and the team, no, I, I, I do not think there is a opportunity to, to degrade the sport. I think we have to be careful. I think it's our responsibility to make sure it rolls out the right way, but we do only see this as an enhancement, um, adding to the existing fan base that I think Scott was, was referencing. Um, I am a fan of the, runs, of the Red Zone, but I still watch my local team in Washington. Um, I, it just makes me care about what else is going on in the league. And without my fantasy league with my friends, I probably wouldn't watch the other games. I'd probably just look up the scores and be done with it. Do you worry about that? Do you worry about sort of the betting components changing the in-game experience in the stadium? I think we have to let the fans consume the game in the way they want to. You know, is there going to be a shift in people only caring about the outcome of the game and only caring about their team's games? Certainly. And we've already seen that with the growth of fantasy sports, that people are not just rooting for what happens in the game and the outcome of the game, but on individual player performances. I mean, we're in this period where our, the, the statistical performances of our players are eye-popping, right? We have triple doubles and 40 point games happening on a regular basis. And so there's so much interest in individual player performances. We have as many stars in the league right now as we have in a really long time. And we think that heightens the interest in our game. And so if our fans want to consume micro segments of our game, I mean, I'm sure you've, you've, you've seen over the last year or so, we've in our League Pass product, we're offering a fourth quarter SKU, a 10 minute SKU. We want consumers to be able to consume the NBA in the way that they want to. And so we want to facilitate that engagement, not inhibit it. I love that, by the way. I love sort of the micro moments. I love being able to turn the game on at any time and sort of seeing it. I have League Pass. I watch it constantly. Um, as a better, I think it's a fantastic experience. And I do think it actually, with 5G, to sort of the, con the, the question earlier, the in-game experience in a stadium becomes all the better because you can do everything that you want to do, like Zach was talking about before, on your phone. So you get the experience of being in the stadium, getting your F&B, and like still being able to watch League Pass and keep track of all your bets at the same time. I reject the premise of this question. I don't think it's going to have an impact on this. Um, this one's for Brian. Where did it go? These are good questions. Are there aspects of betting internationally that we wouldn't want to see in the United States? Another, it's interesting. Um, given that I've been born and raised here and don't spend a lot of time overseas. I feel like Sport Radar, you will represent the entire company. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, again, I, I, I don't feel too convicted on that. I, I, I do think that as operators move over to the U.S. and look to sort of roll out their operations here, what's most important is that they stay focused on, uh, to Scott's point, what the, the betters are looking to do and how they're looking to engage here in the U.S. and uh, not expect that they can take what they've done in Europe, good, bad, or otherwise, and drag and drop it over. So uh, I, I would almost flip that on its head and say, Focus on the consumer, focus on this market, and you'll be all right. And uh, if there are things that didn't go so well in Europe, you can leave them there. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, this is a good question for Doug. Uh, with more casual fans betting, have the way the odds and lines um, been made, is that being changed? Uh, with more, more volume, I guess, is the question. Yeah. <sighs> I have an answer. Not really. What is, what, is, what is it? How so? Oh, I think the bookmakers are much more in tune with where the market is going to go and trying to get there sooner. They're thinking about the casual fans. 
more than they ever have, where it used to be you'd think about what is a fan who watched the game last week going to do, and they will set a line that they are comfortable putting a little bit of cushion so they can move it up if the money really does come in. Now I think they get to that minus seven for the Redskins Giants much quicker than they would normally. So you think it's driven by more handle? Yeah. But the risk, the risk, okay. I think, it's a little more I think handle, it depends on the I, book, right? I think it's a little more handle. I also think, I also think that the casual better is just so much smarter that's, than they were 10 years ago yeah. that it's impacting the way bookmakers think about it. Okay, so I was thinking two years ago pre-legalization of the Supreme Court, but you're absolutely right. The market has gotten tighter because the, the people who were the worst recreation, they're no longer doing it, and the, and the, the, the fan just made a lot more, a lot smarter in the last few years as well. And I just think it depends on the sports book in terms of their appetite for risk, whether they trust the sharp money. But I think technology has helped them find the right line with sort of sharp money flagged accounts, so to speak. So I just think it's all about um, information that they're gathering at a more effective uh, rate. Folks, that's all the time we have today for the panel. Thanks for, uh, to Zach and Brian and Scott and Doug. <laughs>